Hi, my name is Katja Ludwig. I'm from the Machine Learning and Computer Vision Lab from the University of Augsburg and I will present you today how to detect arbitrary key points on limbs and skis with sparse partly correct segmentation masks. I will start off with a short introduction. For ski jumpers, video analysis are important to improve their performance. They are mainly interested in their body joints and the location of the skis in order to assess their performance. Using existing human pose estimation models in is infeasible for ski jumping videos, as the footage from ski jumping is too different. I have some examples here. If we query in the MS Coco dataset for a ski and person, we get images like that. But our dataset has images like this, which is really different. Furthermore, annotations of the skis are not included in the COCO dataset. So, we need annotations, but annotations are costly. Therefore, we are only able to annotate a few key points per image. But if we would have more key points, that would open possibilities for more advanced analysis for the athletes. From previous work, we know that we can derive arbitrary key points from segmentation masks. Hence, our goal is to train a model with automatically generated, partly correct segmentation masks. In order to have a publicly available benchmark, we introduce a new dataset. For that dataset, we use 10 videos from YouTube from ski jump competitions with around 14 hours of video material. These videos contain 370 ski jumps in total and we annotate at most 8 frames per jump to get a wide variety of images. 80% of the images are from the flight phase and around 20% from the in-run phase. In total we have around 2800 annotated frames and we split them in a training validation and test set. We split them in a way that each athlete is only contained in one dataset. We annotate 17 key points. The head, the shoulders, elbows, wrists, hips, knees, ankles, ski tips and tails. Furthermore, we retrieve 424 partly correct segmentation masks with the Detectron 2 framework, which we also split in train, validation and test set. As the validation set is really small, we extend it with some coarse hand annotations that we have in the end 46 validation images. This dataset is publicly available on the link here below. Here you have some example images from our dataset. You can see the segmentation masks and how good they are. Mainly, we have problems with the skis, so in some images we only have one ski annotated or only parts of a ski or only parts of one ski and we also have images where no ski is annotated at all. You can also see that there are difficulties with the boundaries of the body parts, um, for example in the hands or the feet. These are the masks that we use for training. Let's shortly recap how we derive arbitrary points with segmentation masks. In the beginning, we select a key point that lies on the straight line between two standard key points. These standard key points are marked in yellow in this image here on the left. These points on the straight line are the points in green and they are represented by their relative distance to the standard key points, which is marked here with PK. And from these PK values, we generate a key point vector you can see it here marked with a red box in the table um, and we put just pk um, in and 1 minus pk um, in the vector that corresponds to the standard key points, for example here shoulder and elbow. Then we have the thickness um, or the thickness vector pt um, and this is made of uh, the relative distance from this point on a straight line to the boundary of the body part. And to know where the boundary is, we need the segmentation masks. So this blue line here is orthogonal to the line between the standard key points. And these blue dots are the 
intersection between the boundary of the segmentation mask and that orthogonal line. And the orange point is such an arbitrary point and it is characterized by PK and PT, the relative distance from the middle point, so the green point on the straight line, and the boundary point in blue. And you can see how the thickness vector is created here in the table with the red box. So we put um, PT and 1 minus PT um, in the corresponding yeah, boxes. But if we look at the skis, we have a problem. If we have the straight line between the standard key points, which you can see in light blue here for the right ski, we have the problem that not all points on that line lie necessarily in the segmentation mask, depending on the perspective and the bending of the ski. So if you look here at this green point on the line, it does not lie on the segmentation mask. Therefore, um, in case of the skis, we adapt the thickness vector a little. We do not use the relative distance from left to middle or middle to right, we just use the relative distance between left and right and omit the middle. You can see an example also in the red box here. So we have maybe 0.5 from left and 0.5 from right and that would be exactly what would be middle in the other case. As an architecture we use a similar as in previous work so it is based on token pose, a vision transformer architecture. And as an input, we use um, feature patches retrieved from a, a HRNet backbone where the image is fed to. And furthermore, we use key point query tokens. And these key point query tokens are made of the key point vectors and thickness vectors. And they are projected with a linear projection into an embedding space afterwards concatenated and then concatenated to um, the sequence of feature patches. And that is the input to the vision transformer. In the end, we use um, the output of the transformer corresponding to the key point query tokens and use a small multi-layer perceptron to generate heat maps. And from the heat maps, we retrieve the final key point detections. And as the vision transformer is able to cope with sequences of arbitrary length, we can use an arbitrary number of key point query tokens um, as an input to our transformer network. During training, we usually have around 50 points in our sequence that we train with. If we want to generate some visualizations like these ones here, so we only have points um, in these images here, not real lines, um, we see some problems. If we put all points that we want for the visualization um, in one inference step, we can see the result on the left here. So somehow the network um, depends on the number of key point queries and we get worse results if we use a number of points that is unequal to the number of points during training. If you use the 50 points like during training, we have the result in the next image. And if we only use 10 points, which is also different from the typical number of points that the network sees during training, we also get a bad result. Therefore, um, we adapted the attention mechanism. And with this adaption, we get results like in the image here on the right. So what do we adapt? We found that the key point query tokens affect each other and the output changes if the number of key point query tokens changes, which is an undesired behavior. The reason for that is that the attention mechanism correlates all tokens, so the visual tokens and the key point query tokens. And therefore, the key point query tokens have an effect on other key point query tokens and on the visual tokens. So, as a solution, we restrict the attention mechanism only to the visual tokens. So during correlation, the visual tokens aggregate information only from other visual tokens and the key point query tokens, they aggregate information from the visual tokens, but not from other key point query tokens. So in the end, 
The key point query tokens do not have an effect on any other token and only the visual token. Uh, they have an effect on other visual tokens and the key point query tokens. Another problem that we face is that we can use only a few images as we only have a few images with segmentation masks available. Therefore, we use a combined training strategy. For the images with segmentation masks available, we train on the arbitrary key points like visualized here with the images in the upper part. With the other images, where we only have standard key points available and not segmentation masks, we use them also for training. Um, and for them, we use just the standard key points themselves, but we can also train on the intermediate key points that lie on the straight line, which you can see visualized here in the lower part of the image. With this trained model, we try to use pseudo-labels. So, in the first step, we generate some pseudo-labels with the model that we have trained with the combined strategy presented in the slide before. With these pseudo-labels, we have some new training strategies. We can train on the pseudo-labels at first and then fine-tune with the segmentation mask subset. The second strategy would be to train jointly on the pseudo-labels, the segmentation mask subset and the intermediate points, similar to the slide before. But as we find, that does not work very well. We thought that it would be the quality of the pseudo-labels as some of them are wrong. So we try to remove the worst pseudo-labels and as a measurement we use the standard deviation of the detections if we input to our model images the same image with different augmentations and we measure the standard deviation between the detections that our model outputs. The quantitative results from our experience are displayed in this table. The token pose approach is trained only on the standard key points and therefore can only be evaluated on the standard PCK. The vectorized key points approach is from previous work and this is the approach only trained on the segmentation mask subset. You can see that the standard PCK drops enormously here, but we achieve a high percentage of correct thickness. With a combined training strategy with the intermediate key points, which is the fourth line in the table, we achieve quite good results for, for the standard PCK um, in comparison to the vectorized key points approach and also um, the best values for the full PCK, the mean thickness error and the percentage of correct thickness. Sadly, the pseudo-label approach, no matter if we use all, and which of the combined strategies or um, only the best pseudo-labels, we could not get any better results. Apart from the quantitative results, we have also some qualitative results on the slide here. You can see that our model achieves good results, no matter of the perspective and the flight phase of the ski jumps. And if you think of our really bad annotations sometimes in, for the skis, our model is able to detect them quite well. Now, thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and write me an email.